all stand together. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my stairway. He lives. Moment, and um, 
So anyway, we want to pray for her family and lift them up to the Lord. But we rejoice in the fact that she is seeing the fulfillment of what she has been so excited for so many years about. And so just keep, uh, keep her family in prayer. Don't need to pray for her. She's doing fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but we need to keep her family in prayer. And I believe there will be a service coming up. And once we know something, we'll try to get the information around. All right. Uh, we're going to sing a great old hymn. Uh, actually, it's not as old as many of them. It was written about 50, 60 years ago. But let's stand together and sing, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. And we'll take our offering. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, He has seen of my heart. Shadows are spelling with joy, and telling He made all the darkness depart. Everything down and glory fill my soul, fill my soul. When at the cross the Savior came behold, I sinned to wash the way, and my night was turned to day. Everything down and glory fill my soul. Spirit and light from above into God's family divine. Yes, the white glory to the tower and shore. Oh, what a stay is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made. When as a sinner I came to the offer of grace, you did offer the Savior of grace is your name. Yeah. 
that anything that is sound doctrine is rooted in love. Amen. 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 That's right. If there is anything that should be something that we feel, we need to exude God's love. Amen? Amen. Right. And we need to realize that we can disagree with things and not do it hatefully. We can first of all love each other because that is the basis of why we're saved in the first place. For God so loved the world. Everything about the Christian faith is based in love. First of all, God's love and then our love for Him and our love for each other. Amen? Amen. So, as we talk about this issue, maybe you have come from a church where they taught it a little bit different. But this is important because as we read, look at verse 13, 2 Timothy 1, 13. It says, retain the standard of sound words. There is a standard that is based, that is established for the Christian. Not just for the church as a whole body, but for you. There are standards which God's word establishes that you should be living by every single day of your life. There are some Christians that go to church and when they walk out, it's like, okay, I'm done with church for the day. I'm done with God for the week. No, 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 no. The fact is that God has a standard of sound words that we're to live by every day. Thank you, dear. All right, I want everybody. You know what amen means? So be it. So be it. Or let it be so. It, it's saying... I agree, and, and I'm, I'm committed to that. Yes! Let, and that's why amens are good in church. And in every once in a while, a preaching brother. <laughs> Retain. We looked last week and we saw there's two commands here. And that's an important word, command. We're going to come back to the word command. But it says, number one, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. In the faith and love. Faith and love. That's everything we do is based on faith and love. Now you might say, well, this is to Timothy because Paul taught Timothy these things, but he didn't teach me. Everybody hold up your Bible. Paul is speaking to us today. He's speaking to us as believers. These are words for us. Number one, retain sound doctrine. Is there any unsound doctrine going around today? Yes. There's plenty of unsound doctrine, and it is not my place to try to point the finger at anybody. I, I don't care about that. What I want, I, I do care about that, okay? But what I really care about today is that each of us have within us the ability to recognize sound doctrine because we've got the words of God in our heart. And then the second command, it says, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. We've been entrusted with a treasure. The Spirit of God has been placed within us. And we talked about last week that His job is our job. And that is the treasure. We actually represent God's presence in the world. Wherever you go tomorrow, wherever you go today, wherever you go every day of our life, God has entrusted a special treasure to you. You are His representative. What an incredible thing. You know, what do we have in Washington? Guys that are called representatives. They don't always represent us, but they're supposed to. What does the president appoint? When he comes into office, ambassadors, you know that's another word that is applied to Christian, ambassadors. And an ambassador goes to another country and they are to be a representative of the whole total power of the United States as we deal with other nations. What if you got a phone call from the president? Now, I know we have a very volatile president and I don't know what everybody's views are, but whether you like his personality or not, and I had some real problems with his personality in his past, but I kind of like what the guy's doing. I kind of like when I hear that some of the minorities in our country, they have the best job rates they've had in all of 
recorded history. Did you know that? Because ABC and CBS and, and NBC are not reporting that. Amen. The fact is there's some really good things happening. Have you heard about ISIS in the news that much lately? Because their power has been diminished. And nobody's talking about it. Let's go back to my sermon. <laughs> If the president called you and said, I want you to be my ambassador, I mean, you'd probably be scared to death, but you'd also feel, what about me caused him to call me? Well, let me tell you, somebody greater than the president has called you. Somebody greater than the president has appointed you. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ everywhere you go. Amen. What an incredible honor. But God has said, as you do that, you have got to retain sound doctrine and you've got to guard this treasure because Satan is constantly wanting to strip that away from you. And you need to know how to be effective as an ambassador. You need to know how to be effective as a representative. And this passage tells us in a very few words how we're going to do that through Two things, sound words and the Spirit. Now, I've told you, I do not believe God gave us His Word in a, an accidental, lighthearted way. I believe there's significance in everything that God says, and I want you to note the order here. I want you to note the order. What comes first? Look at the verses. There's two things. There's two means by which we accomplish this. Which one comes first? Sound words. Sound words. Now some right there would have a problem with me. They would say, you're diminishing the spirit by saying he comes second. The thing is, the Bible tells us to be discerning of the spirits because there's spirits that are not from God. How do you tell if there if you feel swept away with the spirit and that happens to people? How many of you have ever been to a Christian camp where there was a particular night? Usually it's Wednesday or Thursday night, and it just seems like there's a spirit that sweeps through the, the camp. How many of you have ever been there? A lot of you have. Frankly, I, I would like to see us get camps involved again because God does some amazing things in people's lives at camp. However, there's something interesting that as the spirit moves, other spirits move too. And the night when the Holy Spirit really moves at youth camp, that's also the night that the kids get out of the cabins and they do weird things and, and you know, it just seems like people get caught up in their emotions. If I, we had a pastor, the first pastor I worked with as a full-time associate pastor, in fact, the only pastor I ever worked with as a full-time associate pastor, he used to say, when God saved me, he saved my emotions too. I hope that your emotions have been saved, amen? amen. I hope that God stirs up your emotions from time to time. I hope there has been some landmark experience in the past where God has stirred your heart in a mighty way and you can look back to that and be encouraged. But I hope you also know that walking in the Spirit is not about your emotions. It involves your emotions. But it's not about your emotions. So let's get back to this. It says to retain the, the standard of sound words and to guard through the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to say because there's always going to be opposition in the world. And there's always going to be those who defect. Some of you, in fact probably most of you, know somebody who was at one time seemingly faithfully walking with the Lord and they are no longer doing it. And when you heard about it, it discouraged you. And Satan actually used that to tempt you to no longer walk. How do you avoid that? <laughs> by retaining sound words and by guarding the treasure through the Spirit. Now I want us to begin with our notes at this point. I'm just focusing on those two verses for this moment because 
I want you to realize that the Word is the way that we learn about the Spirit. The Word is the way that we discern spirits. The Word comes first because how did you learn about Jesus? You heard the Word. Somebody shared the Word with you. Somebody somehow, my wife was at home all by herself in her bedroom, but guess what? She looked at the back of a little New Testament that someone, somewhere, had written down the words explaining Jesus. And we always receive Jesus as a result of the Word of God being preached to us, but we also understand how to walk in the Spirit by the Word that God has revealed to us, and we are called to test everything according to the Word. That's why this book should be precious, precious to you. And sadly, many Christians do not realize the tremendous importance, and we need to have the Word not only on the shelf, but in our hearts, the Bible says, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against, sin against thee. thee. We understand that God reveals his word so that we'll know the right way to go. And even as it deals with the spirit of God, we need to learn from the word of God how to allow the spirit of God to work in our lives. So, number one, salvation. This is my interpretation. I'm going to tell you that. There's other people who are going to explain it differently. But I'm going to try not to go too far down that road. Just write this down. Salvation is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, Every one of us started off as the natural man. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about gender here. Back in the old days, you referred to mankind, and everybody knew it was men and women. Now we're not sure what men and women really are. But the fact is, it used to be that we could refer to the natural man as you read it in scripture, and we understood. It's talking about people. It's talking about folks. Before you were saved, you were a natural man. You were a natural person. And now, this is where I'm just going to admit to you, okay? We're going to depart from biblical teaching in the sense that I can't show you the specific verses that talk about every single thing I'm about to do. This is just an illustration to try to help us understand what the Bible does teach. And hopefully, as we look at some passages, you're going to see how this picture is accurate to some degree. But anytime you try to illustrate anything, it's not going to be 100% accurate. I mean, it's just illustrating basic truths. Go ahead and put the picture up. The natural man, we're made up of three different parts, body, soul, and spirit. How many of you have heard people refer to that? Body, soul, and spirit. Okay, that's a common phrase. That's a generally understood thing. And I'm going to just put it, the body, it's the outer part, right? Outside the body are all the things that we experience in the world. Everybody relates to me according to my body. Even if, even if you say, I'm listening to your words, but I'm making my words with my vocal cords and my lips and my tongue and... Everything that we do, we relate to the world in a physical way. We look at it with our physical eyes. We hear it with our physical ears. We speak with our physical mouth. Everything between us and the world is interacted with through our body. But everybody has something inside. And we call that their soul. The person inside of you. I look at Patsy, I see Patsy, but I don't see Patsy. There's a person in there. That, that we relate to. I, I, I look at Taylor and I see Taylor. And there's a person in there I relate to. But the, the thing is, she's thinking about some guy when I'm talking to her. And I, I, we can't see what the other person's really thinking about, right? And, you know, I mean, I'm looking at, at you guys and I'm hoping that you're listening to my sermons. But some of you are thinking about something totally unrelated to my sermon. How dare you? <laughs> 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 
there's a person inside here that nobody really can see. It's just us, and sometimes we don't even understand it. But then, at the very innermost part of our being, I'm going to just call that spirit. And I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Go to the next picture. As we think about our soul, our soul is made up, once again, of three different things. And, and again, you could try to parse this up in, in more pieces than just three. But everybody can relate to these three things. Go to the next picture. Your soul is made up of your mind, will, and emotion. How many of you have heard those three words put together just like that? Mind, will, and emotion. Yes. Now, I have placed them in this order for a particular reason. You have a mind. What do you do with your mind? Think. Think. You think. What do you do with your emotions? Do you feel? If you want to write this off to the side, our mind thinks, our emotions feel, and our will. What does our will do? I'm going to use the word decide or choose. Choose, we choose with our mind. We determine things with our mind. We, we, now, excuse me, I just said our mind. Our mind thinks, see, our mind and our emotions and our will, they're always interacting. Are there some people that live primarily by their emotions? Are there some people that teach Christianity is primarily living by your emotions? When you go away from a church service and you said, I really blank the spirit there. I really felt the spirit there. Is the spirit not here until we feel him? He's here. He's here. He is here. I mean, is spirituality about what we feel? Do you know anybody who is primarily mind? They live according to their mind. They're thinkers. They just somebody that I've known for decades told me the other day. You always, you always. Uh, oh, what was the word he used? Uh, pardon me. Overthink. Yeah, well, that wasn't what he said, but anyway, they, he he told me I overthink things. You always analyze things. Okay, he said you analyze things. You always analyze things. See, he was a guy that lives over in the emotion realm primarily. And according to him, I was way over in the mind realm. Now, I know some people who think that I'm over in the emotion realm. The fact is, we all have a tendency to compare each other to ourselves. You know, we, and everybody leans towards one of these areas. Some people are all about discipline, discipline, discipline. You know, especially with all the health, health nuts running around today. I mean, there's some people, everything has to be done a certain way. And those are people that kind of live in the will. Because the will, since it is the choosing part of our innermost being, the choosing part has a tendency. I mean, we all decide. If you live according to your emotions, guess what? It's because you've decided to. If you live according to your mind, it's because you've decided to. We decide with our will. And so in a sense, regardless of how we live, all of us are truly making choices of how to live. Now I'm going to tell you a little story. I had a girl, one of the things about, we had a camp out, a youth camp out, and back in those days, I was the youth director and I would get a bunch of kids together and, and I look back now and I think, what an, a terrible responsibility is to get a bunch of kids. Do you have, no, I had a kid disappear when we went to Disneyland, he just disappeared. <laughs> And I had to call his parents and say, he took off. His, his, he and his girlfriend had a fight, and he just took off. Here we are sitting in Anaheim, and he disappears. I always used to tell those kids, the number one rule is you come with the group, you stay with the group. If you disappear, I, I, that was my rule before he disappeared. He broke rule number one. But I had a girl come and I knew this girl very little. She was visiting with somebody else, and 
Something happened, I can't remember the details, but this is important. She was an epileptic and she had seizures. And I'm not trying to say anything medical. All I'm saying is what happened. And this girl started to get upset about something and she started to say, I'm going to have a seizure, I'm going to have a seizure, I'm going to have a seizure. And I began to talk to her. And I began to tell her, look, you need to take responsibility for what's happening right now. You need to calm down because you've got yourself all upset about this other thing over here. And I explained to her how that, that's not going to hurt you, whatever it was, I can't remember. But anyway, I just talked her down. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? And you know what she said to me? She said, I didn't know I could control it. <laughs> There's a lot of people going through their lives, frankly, being yanked around by this and that, by Satan. Does Satan yank anybody around? And when she said, I didn't know I could control it, I could tell. I mean, she lit up. She thought she was a slave to these Seizures. Now, am I saying that she could stop having? No, I'm not. Don't don't make it into anything beyond what it is. I just talked to her. She calmed down, and she didn't have a seizure. And the decisions that we make affect the other parts of our lives. For the natural man, for people, it's part of being human. And for her, she came to a new realization. We had a lady in our church in Reading that she went into the mental ward on a regular basis until we had a visiting pastor that sat down with her and talked to her about her life and how it was going on. And she basically came to the same realization that young woman did. She had mental problems, yes she did, but she also had habits that she maintained because she made choices that caused her to be more likely to become mentally unstable. And there are a lot of people who think that they are slaves to different things in their lives when they don't realize that they're making choices to be a victim. And if we would all take responsibility for our lives, even the natural man can take charge over aspects that he may not realize. The natural man is body, soul, and spirit. The soul is mind, will, and emotion. However, the problem with the natural man is, go to the next picture, the spirit is dead. Is that biblical? The spirit is dead. Without Christ, we are dead. Does this mean that they are not, they don't have an inner life? No, it doesn't. And today, we're living in a world where I, I hear this all the time because one of the first questions I ask as a hospice chaplain is, what's your spiritual background? What's your spiritual background? I just want to find out a little bit about people's background. And, and some people will say to me, oh, I'm very spiritual. And honestly, when they use that kind of terminology, it usually points to what? New agey stuff. New agey stuff. Oh, I'm... I'm very spiritual. I dwell in the spiritual realm all the time. You know, and people, because they put an emphasis on, how many of you know people who are not Christians who meditate? I mean, meditation is very, very popular, and meditation can be very, very helpful for people. If, I mean, people are, are told to center, in a sense, you can use this picture and talk about centering. If you recognize that your will centers your mind and your emotions, and you can center yourself and you can live a more successful life apart from the spirit. Did you know that? Did you know that there are people who are spiritually dead who in this life they can seem very spiritual and they can seem very successful and they can seem very balanced because the natural man has all of these things but the spirit is dead, separated from God. And people will disagree with that. People will say, you can't tell me that I'm not spiritual. Because they have a mind, will, and emotion that they can think about things that nobody else knows of. And they can contemplate and they can feel feelings. And, and they can unite with the universe. 
I told you about the guy that I said to him, what do you think is going to happen when you die? He said, this hand will be part of the one star and this hand will be part of another star. The guy was a religion professor. I mean, and he was just basing his beliefs on whatever he came up with. Because he was a very spiritual person who had decided that all religions were false. They were all man-made. But that is why the word is so important. And I won't, that's another sermon. But we believe, we understand, we realize that God has revealed truth through his word. And so I want to point out something. There's a verse that I'm about... I'm about to be so profound, I'm going to amaze you guys. <laughs> the reason I believe that is because there's a phrase in this verse that I was so confused until I realized this fact. People will say, don't you dare tell me I'm dead spiritually just because I'm not a Christian. What does it mean to be alive spiritually? I think and I withdraw in myself and I have these feelings and I have these realizations and I feel unity with the nature and the universe. Is that having a, a spirit that is alive? No, that's having a soul that's active. That's having a soul. And the problem is because it's inside and because we can't dissect it, nobody, no doctor anywhere can dissect a body and say, here's the soul. They can't say. They can say, here's the brain, but they can't say, here's the mind. The thing is, they can remove the brain, but the mind has gone. The soul is gone. And once a person dies, the soul is gone. We can't put our hands on it. So the thing is, we can't tell the difference between the soul and the spirit. But he, Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. I didn't understand what that was for the longest time. But the thing is, God's word it could have said it's sharper than the sharpest scalpel because no doctor can separate the soul or the mind or the will or the emotions. But God's Word can. God's Word can tell us the difference between the soul and spirit. And it says, of both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. See, God's Word tells us why a person who has a very active soul life is spiritually dead because, as you know, when we memorize this as a church, in John 17, 3, Jesus said, This is eternal life that they may what? Know you. When is the Spirit alive? This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I want you to fill in on your notes. Number four, life is knowing God and Jesus. The only way to know God is through Jesus. So to know God is to know Jesus. I'm not going to get off into the Trinity. That's another sermon. But the fact is, when you know Jesus, you know God. When Jesus comes into your heart, who actually comes into your heart? What person of the Godhead? The Spirit. Because Jesus doesn't physically come and enter into your physical heart. No, it's something spiritual. And what happens? The Spirit comes alive. Let's go ahead and go to the next frame. I jumped ahead a little bit. I talked about the fact that the natural man, all of these parts interact. The mind, will, and emotion interact with each other. Have you ever had your will? You're going to buy a new car. Which car do I buy? And so you sit down with consumer reports or you look on the internet and your mind gathers up all this information and you decide what car you're going to buy. See, your mind is instructing your will. Your mind doesn't decide which car to buy. Your will decides which car after it listens to your mind. Or maybe because, man, look at that car. It listens to your emotions and you go buy that one. <laughs> the thing is, they interact with each other and because a person might be very active in their inner life, they think they're very spiritual. But there is something that divides between soul and spirit. The Word of God 
identifies it. What is the spirit of a man? It is that part that knows God. <coughs> and anyone that doesn't know the Lord is dead spiritually. They've got a soul. And by the way, I'm going to refer to this. We looked at the verse a while back and said, He that winneth souls is wise. How do you reach this person's spirit? Through their soul. I mean, you have to appeal. Some people love to witness. I, I do. I love to witness appealing to the mind. But some pastors are incredibly gifted at lifting people's hearts with a sermon. And their soul, may, their spirit may be reached through their emotions. But ultimately, who decides whether to trust Jesus Christ? What part of the person decides? What part of the person decides? End of sentence. Question mark. The will does. We decide, we choose, we may have a tendency to lean one way or another, but we choose, and the fact is that when, uh, when it says the thoughts and intentions of the heart, when you think, you're doing it with your mind, when you intend, you make the choice, you do it with your will, and the scripture says it is when we make the choice to know God through Jesus Christ, that we come to Him. And so salvation, go to the next screen. Salvation is when the Spirit becomes alive and we are in Him and He is in us. Him in us and us in Him. Did you know that the Bible talks about both of those things? We're in Christ, but He's in us. And even the baptism of the Spirit is talked about. We, we have this sense of you know, we know what water baptism is, and we know that it's a symbol of something. It is a picture. It identifies us with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. But see, because Christ has entered death for our sake, when we go into the water, it's not just a picture of being plunged into the death of judgment, because Christ took that for us, but it's a picture of being plunged into him who is the payment for our sin. And here's what it says uh, in Scripture. John 7, 38 to 39, it says, He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from the innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is what the Spirit is. He is placed within us, and then He is to flow out of us. And we're going to get to that in just a second. But the fact is that He is in us. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. In other words, when we were saved, the Spirit of God baptized into the body of Christ baptized us into the body of Christ. So we are in Him and He is in us. Amen? That is what the saved person is. But, that's not where we're supposed to stop. This is not a picture of guarding through the Spirit. How many of you were saved more than 30 years ago? More than 20 years ago? More than 10 years ago. I mean, the fact is, did it stop back there? <coughs> no, it started back there. Our walk with Jesus started back there, and through that whole walk, like I said, some people defect. Am I saying that every defector is lost? I don't know. Some of them are. Some of them, honestly, are Christians. And I'm going to tell you one of the reasons why so many people defect in just a moment. But the fact is, when we come to Christ, we are, He is in us and we are in Him. And I want you to write this down. It is past and permanent. This is in your notes. C. C under salvation. Past and permanent. How do I say that? Just go back and look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Jesus spoke in the John passage and He looked forward to when the Spirit would come, which He did at Pentecost. Paul looks back and he says, what happens to every Christian? 
He says, when you're saved, you're baptized by the Spirit into Christ. Now, this is one of the ticklish issues that we deal with. Everybody knows what the second blessing is. But I'm here to tell you, no, you don't. The fact is, what people are talking about, the second blessing, you don't get saved and then receive the Holy Spirit. These verses tell us that when you're saved, you get the Spirit. You're baptized by the Spirit into Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit comes when you're saved. Amen. But you need something else. You need to protect, to guard the treasure through the Spirit. And that's just another way of referring to walking in the Spirit, living in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit. I will tell you, the baptism of the Spirit is not the second blessing. It is salvation. Well then, Pastor, you're talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's the second blessing. If you only got it once as a second blessing, you're not living the Christian life. The filling of the Spirit is to be today and tomorrow and the next day and in the morning and in the noontime and in the afternoon and in the evening. We are to be filled with the Spirit continually and this is what the Bible calls discipleship. Now wait a second, Pastor. The filling of the Spirit, that's really exciting. But that discipleship, that's, that's what we're Discipleship and the filling of the Spirit, I will say to you, I believe is exactly the same thing. Learning to be a disciple is learning how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this little drawing is just an effort to try to express what that means. Because being saved or baptized in the Spirit is a past and permanent event. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. If you have any question about that, he talks about it as a past and a permanent event. This is what has happened to every Christian who is saved. However, discipleship is what lies ahead of a person once they become saved. And so I want you to look at Ephesians 5, 17 through 21 with me. This is kind of recognized generally as, as the definitive verse about being filled with the Spirit. So then, do not be foolish. Frankly, it's foolish for a Christian not to understand being filled with the Spirit. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. What does DUI stand for? Driving under the influence. When Paul <coughs> refers to being drunk with wine, what is he talking about? He's talking about the fact that if you drink too much wine, you become under the influence of that wine. You're not in control of yourself anymore. And the fact is, I've heard people excuse their actions with this little phrase while I was drunk. I'm free. How'd you get drunk? The will. You made a choice. You made a choice. I've talked to young couples. I couldn't help myself. I've told my youth group, you've got to make the decision back up the road. You've got to decide, don't get in a situation where you're going to be tempted. Our vice president was mocked for the fact that he said, I won't be alone with a woman. And then we had this big blow up about Me Too. And now everybody's saying, you know, you, you, you probably shouldn't be alone with a woman. <laughs> you know what? They're griping. The feminists are griping now because women aren't going to be able to work their way up in the business because somebody won't meet with them. But the fact is, you've got to protect yourself from situations that you'll get in trouble. Doesn't that just make sense? You make choices. So don't put yourself in a situation where it's going to be hard to make the right choice. And this is about something other than my message, so let's come back to my message. No, it actually does have to do, don't be drunk with wine. Don't be under the influence. You dissipate. What, what does dissipation mean? You weaken. You, 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 you destroy your ability to make right choices. You dissipate. I mean, we need to be firm in our discipleship, but when we bring ourselves under the influence of something that robs us of the ability to think and feel and to 
decide clearly, we've done something very foolish. We need to not be under the influence of wine, or under the influence of dope, or under the influence of our sexual drive, we, or anything else, under the influence of peer pressure. We need to be under the influence of what? What does the scripture say? Be filled with the Spirit. Be under His influence. And then listen to this. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. That's a very important part I want to come back to. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. All right, let me go quickly through this. First of all, once again, we have a command. We are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. And it's my understanding in the Greek, I'm not a scholar, but I got the books, and that counts. This word, this verb, means to be continually, be continually. It's not a past permanent thing like this, the baptism of the Spirit. It's something you have to maintain. It's something you have to continually do. Continually be filled with the Spirit. How many of you know how to be filled with the Spirit? Don't answer. The fact is there's a lot of Christians who have no idea how to be filled with the Spirit. And the fact is if we're pressed... We may know, but we can't put it into words. And hopefully I'm going to help you put it into words today. Because if there is anything you need to know how to do, it's the thing that God tells you to do all the time. Does that make sense? And the fact is, some people are burdened under the feeling that I really don't know how to do it because this person, it looks like this and that's just not do you hear what I'm saying? That's right. And this, frankly, is something that some Christians enjoy doing to other Christians. Mm -hmm. It says, be filled with the Spirit, and it says to speak to ourselves, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father, and be subject, interesting, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Okay, let me just break this down quickly. A, command. Write that down. Command. What part of, this, of the soul does a command speak to? What does... A command, how are you supposed to respond to a command? With your will. With obedience, which comes from the wills. I want you to go ahead to the next picture. Okay, I kind of jumped ahead. The thing is, the saved man has the spirit, but the key to understanding the spirit, see all the little doorways? I mentioned this before. Our soul interacts with itself. Our soul interacts with our body. When I decide to go like this, everybody wants, I'm going to do it again. Guess what caused me to do this? I made a decision to do this. And when I, I didn't do it that time, because my will said, no, stop. The fact is, I mean, that's silly, but we all should know that. We make a decision and we act accordingly and our body responds and interacts with the world because of the decisions that we make. Our decisions are influenced by our emotions and by our mind. And I've already talked about the fact that, that some people just live by their emotions. You could circle that little, little box or the little door where the emotions opens up to the, the body. And some people just react. Have you ever just thrown something? Why'd you do it? You were very angry, and you just, I just reacted. You know, what you did is possibly, and I'm not picking on anybody, I've done that. That comes because that door from the emotions to the body has been opened too much. In fact, that door is not a door to open at all. That's a door to lock shut. But how do you do that? You do it by continual practice. Or you, there's another word for that, you discipline, discipline yourself. 
There honestly is a feeling among Christians that the filling of the Holy Spirit is when the Spirit just takes over. He just takes over. And in fact, I heard a pastor say one time, because someone questioned something he said in his sermon, and he said, I don't know about that, because when I preach, the Spirit just takes over. Is that biblical? It's not biblical. The fact is that when something takes over, it's because we have made a choice to let it take over. And I just referred to that about drugs, about alcohol, about all those different things that can take over a person's influence. And the fact is, we are given a command here, and the command speaks to the will. Go ahead to the next screen. A command speaks to the will. And then what is, we're looking at the passage in Ephesians. Now, this is in your notes. It says, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So he begins this command and he says, don't be foolish, but what? Understand. What does that speak to? <coughs> the mind. In order to be obedient to what he's saying, we need to understand. Go ahead to the next screen. That is focused on the mind. But then let's go on through the verse, and he says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. I'm going to jump ahead to the next part. It says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What is the power of music? It speaks to our emotions. Go to the next point. Now, I'm going to come back and refer to that again in just a second. Because this is one of the great weaknesses we all deal with when it comes to being filled with the Spirit. But he says, be filled with the Spirit. And oftentimes Christians equate that with emotions. I just said that a little bit ago. We go home and we say, man, I really felt the Spirit. And what we're talking about is that God did something in our emotions. When I said that God really moves at camps, a lot of times, I'm, I'm referring, it becomes very emotional. But guess what makes the long-lasting effect on a person's life? If not only the emotions, but the mind and ultimately the will are engaged to do something which is in, I think, the next picture. Go ahead to the next picture. The carnal man, what's, I'm sorry, back up to the carnal man. The carnal man is a Christian, he's got the Spirit, but guess what? Life is rough. And what happens when life is rough? We have a tendency to go back to what we're used to. We have a tendency to go back to what we're used to. And when a Christian goes back to what they're used to, operating with mind, will, and emotion, the way that they used to, they become a carnal man. They have the spirit within their lives, but the spirit is not influencing. What is a spiritual man doing? Go to the next one. A spiritual man has made the decision, okay, the Holy Spirit, I want you to be filling every part of my life. If we are mind, will, and emotion, and the Bible says to be filled with the Spirit, what do we have to do? We have to give God permission to influence our mind, our will, and our emotions. What is the primary way that we allow the Spirit of God to speak to our mind? Prayer. Prayer. The Word. The disciplines that we exercise in the, in the Christian life Prayer and the Word of God, we're asking God to speak to our mind. Can I bring you back now to Ephesians? What is the power of music? Paul specifically, he specifically tells us to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Why do we sing songs in church? To worship God. But why else? Why else? Because music that is used to worship God can help you in the area that stands most against being filled with the Spirit. What happens when life gets hard? We feel bad. We feel bad. Well, maybe we feel bad, or maybe we feel bad. 
Now, there's people who have done personality. In fact, there's all kinds of different personality teachings that's usually connected with marriage. One of the things that they say about marriage is you need to learn what kind of person you're married to and understand how they relate to life. I'm going to give you my four kinds of people. You've got glad, mad, sad, and blah. If anybody can come up with a word that rhymes with those other words that says blah, I'll give you $5, okay, because I need to work that into my sermon. But honestly, if you take the four different kinds of personalities, it, there, there are some people that just tend to just kind of be happy-go-lucky, and if there's a problem, the best way that they deal with it is just slough it off. How many Christians do you know that don't deal with the issues in their life because they're just sloughing it off? Let's just go along and let's pretend everything's okay. But then there's other people that get angry. And when things go bad, they get angry and actually get angry where? At God. And what happens to those doors of the Spirit of God when you're angry at God? You just slam them shut. I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. The problem is, the person who's glad, the doors may have shut just as much because they're operating from their soul and not the spirit. And the peer, there's a person who gets sad. I kind of lean towards that. I'm a melancholy type of a person. And when you get really sad, you feel like God has forgotten you. You know what? I had an attack of diverticulitis last week, and God quit loving me. <laughs> because right here, I mean, just right at the very center of my being, I just felt so bad. And so God certainly must not love me anymore. I mean, honestly, that's stupid, but there's ways in which people, when they come to a point of sadness in their life and they cry out to God, deliver me from this, and he doesn't do what they want him to do, they get very sad and feel like God has just rejected them and doesn't want to have anything to do with them anymore. And then there's other people, there's just not a whole lot of emotion. Everything is just kind of blah, I'm just going through my life. And I'm going to leave that and go back to my notes because I want you to understand the mind, the mind, sometimes that mad person, and there's one group that calls that a choleric type of a personality, and that's the person who is a driver and who is driven and a real accomplisher type of person. And when things don't go their way, they get angry and they just kind of take over. And, and their mind, I know what the right thing to do is. I, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And the thing is, the mind is not to dominate us. The mind is not to dominate us. The emotions are not to dominate us. The, the sad person, the moany groany person, the... I say that, like I say, I, I admit, that's the kind of person that I tend to be. Our emotions are not to take dominance. And yet, what is the teaching in some of our churches? Why is it, in fact, that some churches teach that emotions should dominate? Because we, when something really exciting happens, our emotions are stirred up. And like I say, I hope that every person has an experience like that, but you need to understand it properly. How many of you have ever been in a situation where it just seemed like the Spirit of God did something that it just blew the doors open? Have you ever had an experience like that? I'm looking around and seeing a lot of dead pan faces. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just going to share with you that there have been some experiences like that at a, at a camp, at a concert. At church, there have been times just at church, I saw a couple that I loved with all my heart just come up and pray on the front pew together one time. And it was just like God just blew the doors open in my heart. And I just felt his presence in an amazing way. And guess what? I wish that he would do that every single week. Guess what? He doesn't. Because that's not how this filling of the Spirit is. And I'm just going to say, for some people... That's why tongues is such a big deal. I mean, for people who have 
the gift of tongues, the Bible says they edify themselves. When they speak in tongues, it's an over, overwhelming experience of the Spirit. And honestly, there have been times that I've told God, I wish I had the gift of tongues. I wish I could just do something that just overwhelmed me with joy. That's not my gift. And it's not the gift of every Christian. There are, I already said, there are 21 letters to the church that instruct us how to live the Christian life. There is only one that refers to the gift of tongues, and it tells us to restrict it to its appropriate place. The reason tongues is misunderstood is because we read the book of Acts as though it were instruction when the book of Acts is history. God gave the Spirit first to the Jews and then to believing Greeks and then to the pagan Greeks. But after that, the Spirit, according to what the church is instructed, we are given the Spirit at the moment of salvation. But see, when a church has a blow-out-the-doors type of experience, it's really easy to start thinking that the filling of the Spirit is centered in the emotions. But it's not. Here is how... It's supposed to work, I believe, this is my picture, you can compare it to the Word of God to determine how effective it is. Go ahead and put the next picture. The Spirit of God, first of all, if we're going to be filled with the Spirit, the Spirit have, has to have access to our whole inner being. Amen? Amen? And so we need to say to God, Lord, instruct my mind. Lord, instruct my emotions. Lord, instruct my will so that I can choose to do the right things. But, let's go to the next picture. It is the will that is, is called to obey Christ. That means we need to shut the door on our mind and emotions. Shut the door on our mind and emotions? That means we're not supposed to think? We're not supposed to feel? No. No, there's another door. There's another door for the mind and emotions. You don't just blow through and do things according to how you feel. Follow your heart. Yes. Whatever seems right to you. We are told all the time to just do whatever we feel. In fact, we even say, do whatever you feel. Do whatever you feel and you will walk in the flesh. That's right. We're to shut the door. How many of you have heard that song? I was going to tell you about the great old Negro spiritual, and thankfully I looked it up on the internet. That great old Negro spiritual was written by a white guy named Randy Stonehill. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a neat song. Shut the door. Uh, keep the devil outside. Anyway, keep the devil out. But the thing is, it's not just the devil we need to shut the door on. We need to shut the door on our emotions and shut the door on our mind too. Pastor, are you saying don't think? No, I'm saying what it says in Proverbs 13. Or excuse me, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. I know this is one of the verses I refer to all the time. But it's important. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Is that saying don't think? No. It's just saying don't let the mind dominate. There are some times that things seem a certain way to you, but God's doing something else. You don't know yet what God's up to. And so it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Don't let the mind dominate. Do we think? Yes, we think. We let our minds instruct the will. Let's go to the next picture. The mind has to instruct the will. Whenever you read the Word of God, the whole point is so that we can understand. Do we shut the door on our emotions because we don't feel? No, absolutely. Read the book of Job. When you feel bad, talk to God about it. When you feel good, talk to God about it. But the fact is, don't let the emotions dominate. Let the Spirit influence our mind and influence our emotions. Let them influence our will and then make the right choice. And the choice is always to obey the Spirit. When you wake up grumpy, are you mean to everybody? Yes. <laughs> Honey, I'm talking to everybody else too. <laughs> now listen to me now. Listen to me. Listen to me. We as Christians get in the habit of letting our emotions dominate. 
Let me just ask you. When the Bible... Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I didn't refer to... When I said the emotions are not to dominate Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, I refer to this one too all the time. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately wicked. Excuse me, desperately sick. It says wicked in the King James. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Get that? Heart there. Heart usually refers to our emotions. It refers to our inner being. But it says... I'm the Lord. I search these things. God knows what's going on, even if we think we've shut the door on Him. But we need to open the door to Him. He says, I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. How do thoughts become deeds? Because of what our will does. We need to be instructed by the Spirit in our whole being, and then consider with our mind and our emotions, but then by our will, surrender to the Spirit. That means that when we feel bad, we don't do bad. When it makes sense to us, we don't do bad. I mean, I knew a Christian man who cheated another Christian man. And when the, the second one came to the first one and said, why did you do that? He said, it's just business. It's just business. There are some men who compartmentalize their Christianity right out of their business. The fact is, the Spirit is to fill every aspect of our lives. And so I want to bring you to Galatians 5, 22 to 25, and once again, I'm going to amaze you with my tremendous wisdom by just saying, let's believe the Word of God, even when we don't understand it. Because there seems to be a contradiction we think that the, the being filled with the Spirit is the Spirit just takes over, right? But I want to point out something very interesting to you. Galatians 5, 22 through 25 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and... What's that last one? Self-control. What? I thought being filled with the Spirit was when the Spirit's in control. He just takes over. I step up here in the pulpit and the Spirit just takes over. Now, you know what? Every single thing I've said today, I made the choice to say. And I may have said something that might have been a little bit off. But everything that I have said that's been on, guess who gets the, pro the, the credit for that? The Spirit of God, because it's His Word. But the reality is, listen to me, if I operate in anything that is contrary to what I just read, I'm not in the Spirit. That means when I wake up grumpy, I still need to be living according to the, of the Spirit, or I'm not filled with the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit, even though my emotions are there, I don't let the emotions dominate. I ask the Spirit of God to move through those areas. And... I have totally conquered this to where I am always in a perfect mood. No, I haven't. And neither have you. And I'm not saying that we can ever get to where we're some sort of a little automaton, but this is what the Scripture teaches about the filling of the Spirit. And if you have a Christian brother or sister who has told you or implied to you that you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, because you don't do or act in a certain way like they do, that is not biblical. God takes you. God takes your mind, will, and emotions. And you surrender yourself to Him, and you allow your mind and emotions to instruct your will, but your will chooses to be obedient to the Spirit. I want you to bow your heads with this is why I believe that songs and spiritual songs and hymns are so important because our emotions are such a strong part of us and I've had several people say to me the song that we've been ending the service with they sing it all week long that's exactly what I hope for. The song that we sang today is a song that has been instructive to me. It's been a comfort to me. God is the strength of my heart. 
We're probably going to sing that several times over the next few weeks. But as we leave, I want you to carry this song with you. Let there be glory and honor and praises. That's why we sing this song as we leave. So that we can speak to our emotions. You may be a person that you might say, I don't feel God's presence all the time. You know what? That's okay. He's still there. I don't feel happy and excited all the time. That's okay. But we need to surrender our emotions to the Lord and focus on the truths that He has taught us from His Word. And then by an act of our will, choose to bring Him glory and honor and praises. I want you to stand with me. And I want your prayer to be... <coughs> Bow your heads and close your eyes just for another moment. Would you say to Jesus right now in your own heart, or say it out loud, Lord Jesus, thank you for giving me life. Thank you for giving me spiritual life. And please fill every part of my being with your Holy Spirit. Please let me exercise my will to have self-control, not to let my emotions dominate, not to let my mind dominate, but to allow your Holy Spirit to live your life through me as I surrender every part of my life to you. And then help me to know, by doing that, I am filled with your Spirit, regardless of how I feel. Because your spirit is not bound by my emotions or my ability to think and understand that I am your servant. Let's just sing to me.